Hi there. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, my name is Howard Ramsey. Um, if you saw the program before today, my name was Catherine Milligan. Uh, she can't be here today, so it's the four of us here today. Uh, my colleague fetching a glass of water is Michael Ahern. Um, <laughs> on the right-hand side is Caroline Breslin, and this is Sue Barnes here. Okay, we're from University of Strathclyde, which is in Glasgow, in Scotland. Now, just to explain what it is, it is not one of the newer institutions, um, despite its geographical area name. It dates from the late 1700s. And this, I think, is relevant as it's in the groups of the older institutions which are perhaps quite often more decentralised in terms of their control. And this has had a significant impact on the institution's adoption and innovation in terms of learning technologies. And as you see, Strathclyde has a lot of technologies. Going back to 2005, the institution decided now is the time to implement an institution-wide and uh, funded virtual learning environment, uh, which was called Learn Online at Strathclyde. If you can see the cheeky little logo in the bottom left, you'll see it was in fact WebCT. Okay, and it was set up and funded as a five-year project, project in the sense that there were five years of funding available, uh, with the idea that it would be reviewed at the end of that, see where we'd got to, no one really noticing that five years is an eternity in terms of technology. So perhaps that wasn't the most sensible step to do this for such a long period of time without review. Um, WebCT was a qualified success in that by the time um, of September last year there were about 3,000 classes live on WebCT. Michael's nodding, 3,000 classes live. However, at the same time, the science faculty had been developing their own platform. And by September last year, it too had about 3,000 classes running on it. Education were sometimes using WebCT, sometimes using first class. And some were even using Sakai. Because of the... Um, the nature of the culture in Strathclyde that had developed over the, the decades, the generations, um, there was quite often an attitude, well, this system doesn't quite do what I want it to do, or they thought it didn't quite do what they wanted to do, even if it did. Um, I have a budget. I'll do it myself. I get complete customization, complete control. Over in the business school, another platform built from the ground up. Uh, supporting the MBA in this case. Um, however, through the five-year period of WebCT's instigation and uh, development, it did start to occur to people that perhaps it wasn't the platforms that were the whole issue. Perhaps it wasn't the functionality, but also the business processes that we used to implement these and to allow access to these. You might, it's quite blue, but you might recognize what that platform is. Because some naughty people in the business school were actually using Moodle. That was me. If you look back in the archives, five years ago I spoke at the Moodle conference, the lone voice at Strathclyde. Engineering were using something else as well. Goodness knows what it was. Caroline may know. Okay, so... And since 2005, the use of these platforms wasn't actively discouraged. There might be comments, but uh, if there were sound educational reasoning given for the use of these, then they were generally accepted, if not supported particularly. So you get the result that this is very, very expensive. So after the five years, we have the review which comes along, and you'll see from the dates, it took quite a long time since it went over two years, which again is almost an eternity in terms of technologies. So the issue is we had multiple learning systems. This clearly was a nonsense. We, it, it didn't make sense that they all had to be different. Surely there was massive overlap. Something that also started to emerge was we had multiple student, student management systems. And I'll go into this in a bit more detail later. 
We had staff working in perfect isolation. I had worked in the business school for seven years. Uh, Caroline here had worked in another of the university departments, a central department, for all those seven years and a couple before, and our paths had never crossed. I sit in an office all on my own. It was nice. The central resource in terms of staffing was, it varied over the years, but generally between two to three uh, full-time equivalent staff members servicing an institution with 20 to 30,000 students in total. So it, it was very often simply reactive rather than proactive just through necessity. Uh, clearly duplication of effort. If I didn't know what someone in engineering was doing, we could quite possibly be doing the same thing, developing the same tools, not learning from each other. Very, very wasteful, inefficient. Not very healthy professional environment, in fact. So inefficiency and waste, which these days obviously is something we're all quite frightened of, considering the, the cuts, uh, I was going to say pending, but in fact happening at the moment. Um, the other side of that coin was uh, frustration from staff. Why do I need another password for this? Why doesn't this tool do this because that tool does that? And students, how am I supposed to know where I'm sub submitting my assignment? In that department I do it there, in that department I do it here. It didn't make us look very good and it wasn't giving a coherent um, educational experience for the students. I joined the review about halfway through the process. And I remember coming out of the first meeting of the review thinking, did I imagine all that in there? Because what I felt was we were looking at some systems which were predominantly for teaching and learning, WebCT, Blackboard, Strathclyde Spider, and Moodle, of course. But we were also throwing into the pot um, systems which were predominantly for student administration. And I would have put Strathclyde's Spider platform into that category. Um, and I have to say this is not an institutional statement. I personally wonder if in our review we had the right people doing the reviewing. Had they ever taught using technology? Had they ever taught using an online platform? Or had they simply used a lot of technology for student administration? Uh, a consultant came in early on in our decision-making process and said, you only really have three choices, <laughs> apparently. Uh, you stick with WebCT, I move up to Blackboard. You roll out Spider for the entire institution, or you go with Moodle. So how do you make this decision? Well, the method we used is one that the business faculty at Strathclyde uh, teaches, which is multi-criteria decision analysis, uh, with software developed from one of the departments in the business school. Now, I won't go into great detail about this. It is quite fun. That might not look it. Basically, you break down your criteria of what matters to everybody, and you give them points. If you think, well, that needs broken down, you break it down, you weight them, and you get this fancy diagram. Now, here you see the three choices on the left. Spider, Moodle, and Blackboard. And in fact, in this one, Spider comes out slightly ahead. I think this was at the midway point in the process. The point being, this does not give you the answer. But it should make you think, ooh, that doesn't look right. And if you have the, ooh, that doesn't look right, you've probably missed something out. So, in the end, the choice for Strathclyde was Moodle and the decision was, what swayed it was the international aspects. We decided we didn't want to be inward looking simply and use an internal platform or I'd currently be speaking to the pharmacy department at Strathclyde because there would be no conferences for this kind of thing. However, we could, simply couldn't junk all the other functionality that, that the other systems had. Much of it was very rich, valuable functionality and we couldn't simply say Moodle will do that. Um, so this is the sort of top level idea of what we're to implement. So level zero, the core VLE, read and write access to university data, and in there would be Moodle, would be the timetabling system, all integrated, registry, authentication with Shibboleth. Going up one level, 
unique functionality in departments. So um, the law school have simulated professional learning environments. There's pretty much no overlap with functionality in something like Moodle, but we don't want to send students to multiple places, so they need integrated. And then level two, which um, is really what Gronje was talking about in her presentation this morning, all the other stuff, which it's pointless to list because it will change every nine months, every 12 months. So the outcome, as I said, was number one, the adoption of Moodle as the core of this, and secondly, the reorganization of the support staffing around this. And at this point, I'm going to hand over to Michael, who will take you through the next part. Yeah, thanks, Hart. Right. Um, I was just wanting to talk about some of the um, kind of technical, or if you want to call them operational issues, that we had um, as part of the, the move over from WebCT to to Moodle as the central part of this unified VLE. Um, the, the main one that, that was actually probably the only issue that we had um, that was threatening to actually derail the whole process was the migration of the WebCT content from WebCT into Moodle. Because um, I think um, a lot of people in the, the team who decided that we were, I should say, we, we actually did, we changed over um, in one go from Moodle onto WebCT um, because rather than running the two side by side. So, so the people that had kind of decided that, I think, didn't, um, were thinking of it maybe like an email system or something like that where it's relatively easy just to move data from one into another. Whereas, as we all know, VLEs are very different and there's a kind of conceptual differences sometimes between the, the tools. So, um, so, I mean, relatively early on in the, um, the implementation, we had we had migrated manually a few WebCT courses over from WebCT into Moodle um, and had done a kind of back of the envelope calculation and reckoned that we would be able to manually migrate the stuff in good time for the, um, the, you know, the, the staff, to the academics to um, tune them up for the switch over in the September of that year. Um, we did this for a couple of months and we were finding most courses were really easy to move over. You just pull the quizzes out using Respondus and you know, just kind of pull files over, and it was really easy. Um, but occasionally you would get one that just took four or five days because it was so complex, and we realized this wasn't going to work. So um, we started trying to look at automated migration systems, um, actually writing one ourselves. But just by chance, I ran into um, a child called Steve Coppin from the University of Kent. Um, at a developers conference and it turned out he had written uh, an automated migration uh, tool for um, WebCT Campus Edition to Moodle. So, um, so, so we ended up, uh, we, we developed a, a relationship with Kent and uh, to, to use this tool as a service to pull in the, the data from WebCT into uh, Moodle and so between the, the July th or the February when I met Steve and, uh, and the July, sorry, when uh, we had kind of planned to have the, the data migrated, we actually did, but um, it was done automatically. Um, and I think if we hadn't done that, we would have, um, the, whole, the whole implementation would have been way off um, kilter. The, the only plan B we had was basically pay Blackboard another year's license fees, which wasn't really... Um, very nice sort of option. So, um, this, the second operational uh, thing that was um, we had to do was to integrate the the middle system with our central uh, IT systems because uh, most of Strathclyde we've got a history of um, building systems from scratch to do things. So our student record system, finance, and HR systems are all um, developed in house, um, and there's a kind of <coughs> massive monolithic database behind the, that the, um, in Oracle, which contains you know, all student data. So um, when we were running WebCT, we did have an integration between the two systems to, um, to create courses, um, course sites in WebCT, and to pull students into them. Um, but when, when we were, because um, Moodle was then going to be a core service rather than a project, which WebCT had been, um, we looked at, at making that integration a bit tighter, so we, um, essentially took the um, 
every single course that, or every single class, sorry, that was running, um, and created an empty Moodle site for it, which was a, a departure from the way we'd done it before. Um, and I was a bit sceptical about this idea at first, but it's actually worked out really well because when students come and ask why their class isn't on the VLE, it's not because it isn't on the VLE, it's because the lecturer hasn't engaged with the VLE to kind of make anything available with it. So um, it, there's, um, there's a kind of, um, not pressure exactly, but it, it helps to encourage use of the VLE by the, the academics. Um, the other good thing about the integration of the central data was that um, we have this thing called the class catalogue, which is actually a publicly um, available website listing all the data um, for all the classes that run at Strathclyde. Um, and very few people know it exists. Um, and anyone that does know it exists um, kind of said to us, why are you using the data from that? It's all rubbish. <laughs> so, um, so, but we, we kind of said, well, that, that is the only central data that we have access to, so we have to use it. And, um, and so that has actually um, been really helpful in that people um, have been engaged with the, um, the registry system to get their, the central data up to date, which um, has been fantastic. And it also improved the business process in that um, registry got fed up with so many people um, fixing their central data or requesting fixes to their central data that they actually created um, a, a sort of an interface to allow departments to do that themselves. So I mean that, that was a, a real um, sort of benefit of doing the, the Moodle integration. Um, some other technical issues that we came across, um, the, the main thing probably was because we, we had to uh, implement it very quickly. Um, and we, we didn't really have the opportunity to get in any new technical staff, so it was done by a lot of us who, um, who were working with unfamiliar technologies. The infrastructure guys um, had to learn things like shibboleth and sort of load balancing and all these stuff. I mean, they're, they're sort of Unix and Apache gurus, but they, they had to learn a whole lot of new stuff to get, um, get this up and running. I had to learn more than I ever wanted to know about materialized views in Oracle. Um, and so, um, I mean, some mistakes were probably made just because a lot of the technology was so new to us and we didn't necessarily have the, um, the, the kind of deep expertise that you, you need to run a, a central system. Um, one of the, well, the, the two, two main things that came out of that were um, we, the infrastructure team didn't really use MySQL previously, so um, we had problems with database tuning. Um, and uh, that, that actually caused a lot of problems at the start of term, but uh, with some intervention from a Moodle partner who we engaged um, a bit later than we ought to have done, we managed to get that fixed um, quite quickly. And the database is now running at like one or two percent of its capacity. Um, so, you know, that, that was quite useful. Um, the other problem we had was with the, the chat tool, which was um, heavily used by a very, very small percentage of classes. Um, we, it was my fault actually, because we, we, I was aware that there were two different implementations of chat within Moodle. Um, and so we, we started off using the first one with, in the back of my head, was thinking that if that didn't work, we would just move on to the, um, the sort of more complicated one. It was a, a daemon service that runs. Um, but we, when we found that the chat wasn't working, um, we moved on to the second service and found that that wasn't particularly scalable either. Um, so we ended up um, with a small number of very unhappy people. Um, and we ended up, uh, I re-implemented that using a, a sort of Jabber XMPP server back end. Um, am I over time? <laughs> um, in fact, that, that's probably a good place for me to stop. The other thing um, we did was that we created some development processes that um, in order to pull in external tools, from, particularly from the spider system that Howard mentioned, um, we, we can't keep providing, you know, ha having the idea of Moodle as a, a sort of provided service, we have to have it as a platform where um, departments can um, develop their own tools. So, so that's the kind of challenge facing us probably at the moment is to, um, to try and work out a sensible way to allow 
um, people out within the, the university to develop um, plugins for Moodle without um, complicating it for other users or you know potentially downing the system. Um, and that's, I say, that's a challenge that's still in progress. So, um, so that, that's going to round up of the, the technical issues we faced. Um, we want to Caroline for um, some of the more staffing and structure. I think. Um, what I'd like to do is just speak a little bit about the second recommendation um, that Howard mentioned earlier. So the first recommendation of the review was the adoption of Middle as our core unified VLE, and the second one was a complete reorganisation of the support staff. So options for this could either have staff based within faculties, which the departments and faculties tend to favour, it's got more acceptability, they feel more ownership of the system and perhaps you know better local control that they can get things done faster. But lacks the efficiency of a centrally based team and um, that view of strategic level development where you know, you're looking at the university as a whole. So what we opted for was a hybrid approach and the initial, um, th this is the structure we have here. The learning technology enhancement team which is headed by Catherine Milligan is part of the Centre for Academic Practice and the intention there was that it's research led pedagogical research would feed into how we operate and the kind of things that we offer. When the learning technology advisor posts were advertised, what they looked for were part-time, but aimed at people who were already based within faculties, so it was essentially a part-time secondment or a permanent secondment, if you like, to a faculty. So each faculty is now being supported by someone who has had teaching experience within that faculty and it was a kind of best of both best of both approach the learning systems developers Michael's one and we have a, a second Michael as well although they're part of our team and we all share the same office they formally report through the information services directorate so we're very much a cross department team within the university and so far I have to say that's working very very well one of the um, I'd say one of the key things that's led to um, a successful partnership working model is although we have this office and you know we all, we all share the, the office, the faculty based advisors are very much part of the teaching within departments and get out and about and so you know, we're quite a spread out campus in the city centre. We're not permanently in our offices, we're out and about and in classes and supporting teaching directly as well as working within our team. The board is headed by our Associate Deputy Principal, Colin Grant, and we also have lots of other representation on there so that everyone has a say. So we have the Vice Dean Academics for each faculty, we have Information Services, we have technical staff from departments as well who have an interest, and support staff as well. So. The idea there is definitely the hybrid, so we're not stifling any local development. It has an opportunity to come up through this structure, but we also are being led from the top as well. Having an advisor for each faculty, and we also have one institution-wide <coughs> advisor, it allows us to have a different approach for support for each faculty because the departments and faculties have their own expertise. Some of the more cash-rich and more technical departments tend to be asking for different types of support, maybe more sophisticated support. Some of the less technical departments are requiring help with more basic things, but we're there for all levels of support. But it allows us to give a, a different approach to support, and we've set up a technology forum for learning and teaching for each faculty. And again, these aren't the same. Each of the four faculties has a completely different model to suit their, their own requirements. We've talked a bit about changing processes at the university and one of the, one of the major ones at university level, this isn't something we're in charge of but we're part of, is um, the developers forum. So it's essentially owned by information services but it operates at a university level. So again this allows say, any central developments that are being planned get input from the departments via technical staff or even via academic staff. 
but it also allows a path for bottom-up developments. So Howard mentioned lots of developments happening at various levels within departments and faculties. Being part of the larger development forum gives a path for them to be taken up centrally. Um, and one of, the, one of the things that we try to do there is try and establish a set of common requirements. So, for example, project selection tools is quite a common one, and this existed on one of the, the old VLEs that Howard spoke about. Initially, what we'll do is take that functionality so that they can have a replacement and they have the functionality that they need access to, but in the longer term, as a faculty-facing learning technology advisor, each of us has a remit to look at the requirements across the faculty and see if we can establish a common set of requirements or even different options so that one good functionality can be rolled out to everyone and we all get the benefit of it, um, but two, that people aren't losing things and that they can, they can take their own developments to the centre. So that's been a major change in process for us, the partnership working, and obviously we have new processes in place which we're, you know, we've set uh, developer guidelines. You know, we can't just take any piece of code and, and put it in our central system. There's obviously have to be standards and guidelines that are adhered to in order to make that work. Um, lots of benefits, obviously, greater efficiencies, prevention of duplication, and the university working together towards, towards common goals. Where possible, there may still be cases where local developments are required. I'm going to hand over to Sue now, who will talk a bit more about um, our partnership working. Hi, so I'm Sue Barnes, and um, I'm a learning technology advisor uh, facing the science faculty, but part of the, the learning technology team. Um, uh, so, as, as Caroline said, as part of the review, the, the partnership working model uh, was something that was very much at the forefront. And um, I've divided the way that we're working partnership really into two, uh, two parts, looking back as being reactive and looking forward as being proactive. But actually, I've done that because I'm a math mathematician by... Um, by nature and I wanted it to be tidy but really it's nothing tidy at all about it and we've been both proactive and reactive uh, in both places really. Um, so uh, in terms of uh, looking back, as I say, we are, we are being very reactive uh, but we've been proactive in, as well in terms of obviously setting up training sessions and, and so on but it's been very much um, to do with reacting to the needs of the academics of the Moodle users. Um, in terms of what we've been doing. Uh, so one of the, the main points of contact, one of the big wins I think that we've had is, is our learning technologies email address um, that we've, we've used or, got, or asked the academics uh, to use uh, very much and so that we all see all of the emails that are coming in but we are all facing our own faculties uh, and so reacting to those and so that because we're facing the faculties or, or one of us is a cross institution, we're getting to know our clients within our faculties but we all know what each other are doing. As Howard said before, he was very happy before working his own little office, and now we're all in, in one big office, although Howard goes off and hides quite often. But, but that's uh, very much, uh, in terms of the partnership, we have the partnership looking to the way that we're working as a team, as well as the partnership that has established between us uh, and the faculties. Um, so we've, a lot of what we've been doing over the last year is in terms of one-to-one -one support, responding to emails um, from academics saying this doesn't work, that doesn't work, we need to do this, uh, and so on. Uh, and that goes forward really into the next year because although we've dealt with the WebCT um, users, we still have the Spider users, the Strathclyde users, and uh, the First Class users, and so on. So that does go on. Um, but very much a relationship there being built out of a one-to-one -one relationship. But in terms of our role then, uh, learning technology advisors, um, we've all been working then in very different ways. It's Strathclyde, as probably many other universities. Um, all the faculties, all the departments work in their own way. They want to work in their own ways. And so that each department facing uh, advisor has had a very different role. For example, in science, there's been very little use of WebCT. So in a way, I'm waiting to do my job in terms of bringing the spider users on board. Um, but because, as Caroline said, we, we know the faculties that we've come from and we've been in a very good position to be able to respond to their needs and kind of understand the thinking behind them. 
Uh, we also have done a, a, a lot more than just facing the faculties and academics in faculties and the uh, cross-institution learning technology advisor and the rest of us together, we have supported, as I've seen here, uh, student services, help desk, etc., the Center for Lifelong Learning, staff development. So really all sorts of faculty, uh, sorry, institution-wide um, bits and pieces that are working outside of the faculties. And part of really what we've done and part of our strength, I think, the big prize is that we have uh, been very willing to talk to everybody and, and to bring this discussion about what we're doing um, you know, out into the open. So in terms of looking forward and, and being a little bit more proactive, um, what we don't want to be doing is, is going to the, the academics, although some of us are kind of academics um, really, but we don't have those labels. We don't want to go out there and saying this is what you should be doing. Um, because I think academics don't really like that. But we want to, to be able to share the good practice and the innovations uh, that's going on in the university that's going on um, outside of that. So we want to find very much a way of making that work. And part of what we're doing is to set up partnership forums. And again, in the faculties, we've done this all in very different ways, depending on how the faculty works. Uh, so in some cases, there is a formal uh, forum that meets uh, regularly. Sometimes that happens through the learning and teaching committees, uh, and sometimes very much more to do with one-to-one -one contact. But it's very much um, a focus of, of this communication between the faculty in terms of finding out what's happening and, and what is needed and sharing that. Uh, across the institution, um, the role of the cross-institution advisor really is to look uh, outwards to sort of horizon scanning what else is going out, uh, outside of the institution and to, to allow the sharing of good practice of what's happening outside. And it, through that, with other people in the university, we're going to put case studies of good practice into the learning and teaching uh, repository so that, again, we're sharing the good practice that's happening in the, in the institution um, and outside. And then I've got a little diagram because I'm a mathematician. I thought I would have a diagram in here. It kind of looks at the way that we're working. One of the big prizes here is uh, for the, the university's strap line of one Strathclyde. Um, historically, there has, as I've said, there's been lots of departments working in their own little areas, doing their own little things. But we're trying to bring all of this together in terms of being more efficient, in terms of using people's time and using finance. Uh, so that we've got this um, kind of a way of communicating, which I feel is very much one of the, the big prizes. Uh, we can feed into the Learning Technology Board, which then feeds itself into the, those people at the top that do all the deciding of what's actually going to happen. Um, but our feeding into the board really is, is the Learning Technology Enhancement Board, is where we can share ideas between what's going on in different faculties. So from the faculties, through the learning technology partnerships, through the learning technology advisors and developers, we bring that to our team meetings. If necessary, that goes through to the board. We can then share ideas and then take that back to our faculties. So any developments that are happening um, in terms of, for example, the project choice tool that's happening for, for one department, then that is going to be spread out then across the whole university and becomes a functionality for all. So in terms of, of the, the big prize, this is Strathclyde. We're trying to get Strathclyde here to work together and, and being quite clever in terms of getting academics to share what they're doing uh, and what they would like to do. And now I think it's back to Caroline for a moment, sorry. Okay, very, very quickly then. Um, just wanted to share some examples of the good practice of the partnership working, so faculty-led initiatives have been things that the faculty have come to us to say we want this can you help us do this sometimes with funding as well for our time so um, you know bits of functionality like you know we want the lessons in Moodle to be printable well you know we can we can set a development path in motion for that and um, peer rating of grades for group projects one with funding um, that we got recently was for student CPD, so they wanted students, industrial partners, alumni all to work together, and they've you know, offered us some funding to help with that. Um, faculty developed, so I mentioned the project selection tool, where something's actually been developed within a faculty and kind of given to us to roll out. 
led by us as well. So, you know, we're part of the Centre for Academic Practice. One of the recent things we've been involved in is a pilot of a peer review approach, and that's been a, an externally funded project. We've gone out to the faculties, we've looked for volunteers, we've given them a bit of funding to get involved um, and hopefully publish some results on that and, and offer a better central system um, as a result of that. Responding directly to student feedback, we take that into account as well. We've changed the look and feel and certain bits of functionality. And finally, working with professional services. Um, so case in point there was the disability service at the university. We've worked in partnership with them to make improvements um, based, on, based on their feedback. Going to the um, title of the, the, the presentation today was The Good, The Bad and The Ugly. This was something we had talked about not long after the start of term. It's very unscientific. It's just um, some of the, the, the email quotes that we came in. We're fortunate that most of it has been good so far. Um, most people are happy that we're there and, and ready to support them. The bad, Michael probably mentioned some of the technical issues we had. We had um, a lot of issues at the very start of term when load was very, very high and we had lots of simultaneous logins and we had to, to fine tune the database. Um, the ugly will include, um, this is a case of academics not wishing to work in partnership. Um, we can help people with their courses. We helped with the migration. There were some classes that had to be kind of tweaked manually, but obviously we need the cooperation of the academics for that. We don't know what's in their head or what they want to achieve un unless they'll speak to us about it. Or do we have time for questions? Or are we? Well, I was going to say, um, perhaps over lunch we'll have questions. Uh, OK. It is actually lunch time. OK. But I okay. think we've maybe got two minutes. Howard well, wanted possibly, to... Well, that's possibly, but let's see how this goes. But okay. what I'd like to do is, is thank you for your, your talk on the unified DLA. And I've got in my notes here how you broke it down into four particular um, areas. There was the organisation issues, which I'm sure you found very interesting. And then the technical and operational issues and how you manage that, that transport from WebCT to Moodle and, and all the other uh, bits that were in there. And, and quite possibly they would be ugly, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> um, and then you touched on the staffing issues and, and finally looking at um, working in partnership and, and the sense that I have, and, and probably this is shared by uh, most of all people here, is the fact that it was a, a unifying reality. Mm -hmm. and, and that's actually, you know, it has brought you together. You know? um, I, I'm, I am conscious of the time and the fact that uh, lunch alarms have gone off with people's stomachs. Um, would, you be, would you be okay to, to take questions over lunch? Any or all of you would be happy. Yeah, we'd be we'd be happy yeah. to take any okay. questions over lunch. And, okay. And yeah, we'll be here if here. anyone wants to come and chat. Yeah. 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 Um, on your behalf, I'd like to thank the uh, the staff team. Um, we're very sorry that Catherine couldn't be here, and uh, pass on pass on our best wishes, please. But to, to Michael, Howard, Caroline, and Sue, thank you very much for that today. Thank you. Thank you.